Uh, let's turn together in God's Word to the Gospel of Mark, Mark 1, and we will look together at verses 40 through 45. Mark 1, verse 40 through 45, where God's Word reads as follows, And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your, show yourself to the priests and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places. And people were coming to him from every quarter. So far, the reading from God's word this evening. May he add its blessing to our hearts. In another place of scripture in 1 Samuel chapter 15 is the account of the newly anointed King Saul. And he is plucked from the people of Israel by God's choosing and made to be a king of all of Israel. And chapter 15 is an account of how he blunders his way into God's rejection. It's an account where Saul exercises his power as a king, which was given to him by God and a new privilege for Saul, the son of Kish. But he does so in a way that disregards God's commands. So Saul exercises his authority, which is derived from God, while disregarding the way God would have him wield this authority. And in some sense, the account that we're looking at tonight is related. It's related as God gives commands to people in a specific place, in a specific function, with a specific role. And those people, though God has given to them a great gift and has blessed them with, with, in a way that, that very few people have been blessed in, in this world, even though God blesses them in this way, they leave aside what God would have them do to follow after the things that they would like to do. And that's the, that's the similarity between Saul, son of Kish, and this leper who has healed. And you might even say that the offense in our text here tonight is, is a greater one, uh, because the, the person who was healed came face to face with the word of God in the flesh, had a miraculous sign performed uh, on him, very visibly, very dramatic, very drastic. Uh, but they, they are in that way uh, similar, that they follow after their own ways rather than following after the commandments of God. But what we do see from this, this, uh, this account from the Gospel of Mark, and even the reaction that it conjures up in us as we read it, we, we see that Jesus' kindness and compassion warrants man's complete and grateful obedience. There's something about reading this account where it's intentionally recorded in such a way that you kind of wince at the end when the man goes and does what Jesus explicitly told him not to do. It's not a matter-of-fact recording of facts, but there's something in the account that makes us recognize something in this man is all wrong. And so we want to look at, at uh, this leper who is healed, and we want to see the highs of his life in these few verses that we have of him. And we want to also see the lows of his life. So we want to see that Jesus' kindness and compassion <clears throat> warrants man's complete and grateful obedience. And we're going to see the highs of the healed leper and the lows of the healed leper. So let's begin with the positive. Let's, see, let's look at how uh, this leper uh, lives in uh, faithfulness to the Lord. Our text today is an account of one of the rejects of Jewish society being welcomed back into life among the people of God. It is an account of one who faced a sure and certain sentence of death, being given life again and having his health restored. 
And the root of seeing that is really to understand what's going on with the fact that this man is a leper. What is this leprosy and, and why is it significant to help us understand just how dire this man's situation was? Well, to understand leprosy in, in the ancient world, you can go to Leviticus 13. Uh, Leviticus uh, sometimes is divided up into two different sections of codes of holiness, one for the priests and, and one for the people. And in the holiness code of Leviticus, so in the laws that God gives to his people to set them apart from, from all the other nations, in that holiness code, in chapter 13, there's a whole chapter devoted to what to do with the disease of leprosy. And uh, there was a, a difficult, complicated process and being examined multiple times by the priests, and the priests would make a decision of whether a person was a leper or not. And if he was a leper, he would automatically be classified as one who is unclean. Now, in Israel society, to be designated as unclean was very significant. For a priest to declare that you are unclean was not a matter of, uh, of just a shrug of a soldier, uh, shoulders. It, it would change your life. You would be ordered to live outside the camp. You wouldn't be allowed to dwell with the people. People wouldn't be able to come near to you without you announcing to them that you are unclean. Uh, Leviticus 13 and verse 45 describes this for us, where it says, the leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose and shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. So the result of being diagnosed with leprosy among the people of Israel was a complete and utter ostracization. Uh, no longer could you live with your family. You had to live outside the camp. No longer would you be able to be near people, to enjoy the embrace of people, to be in the same room and sharing meals with people and laughter. Uh, you were completely isolated except for the other lepers, of course, who, who lived around you. And so we see that to be a leper then would remove you from the rest of society. And Jesus interacts with that kind of person in these verses. A person who has lived under the crushing burden of being isolated from the rest of society with a sure knowledge that eventually he will begin losing parts of his body because the nerves are dead and his flesh is rotting. And Jesus interacts with this man with kindness and compassion. In Mark's account, really, it's Jesus' third specific wonder. What do I mean by that? Well, in the first place, we saw Jesus casting out the unclean spirit in the synagogue, beginning in verse 21. When he's, in, he's in the synagogue at Capernaum. That's a specific description of, of, a, of a miracle that Jesus performed. Uh, then we saw Jesus healing Peter's mother-in-law in, in verse 31 of chapter 1. Another specific description of something that Jesus done, uh, has done as a healing. All the other wonders that, that Christ has done in the, in the book of Mark so far have been generic in nature. Uh, he heals many with various diseases. He casts out many demons. But these three are specific descriptions of something that Jesus does. He casts out an unclean spirit, he heals Peter's mother-in-law, and here in this case, he heals this leper. Now this wonder is different than the other ones. This is the first wonder where the person being healed is requesting that Christ would perform this on him. You see, the demon is cast out without any invitation at all. Uh, in fact, the, the demon is actually belligerent against the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, and challenges him in, in some, some way. Uh, Peter's mother-in-law, uh, she doesn't ask for the healing herself, but others ask for this healing in her behalf. 
But here when it comes to this leper, this leper himself pleads with Christ that he would be healed from his disease. Now it's remarkable already in the first place that this leper could get anywhere near Jesus because he was supposed to be outside the camp. And yet we, we don't know if, if, if they were just lax about those rules where, where this particular miracle takes place or, or if Jesus is in an isolated place where this man could dwell. Whatever the case may be, Jesus comes near or uh, the leper comes near to the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. And this leper, in some sense, is already demonstrating a measure of faith. It's remarkable that this leper comes to Christ and see how he approaches him. Uh, he, he already acknowledges his knowledge, his certain knowledge, that Jesus can do the things that he's asking of him. So this leper comes to Christ with a measure of faith, confident that Christ can do what the leper is asking of him. But the leper, when he comes and asks of Jesus to make him clean, he doesn't do it, he doesn't make it, this request, as an impetuous demand. What does it say in our text about how the, the leper comes to him? Well, it says that when the leper speaks to Christ, that he is kneeling. In verse 40, kneeling, he asks Jesus to make him clean. And so there's a great humility in some sense that's already resident in the heart of this leper. Not only does he come knowing that Jesus can do the very things that, that he's going to ask of him, but at the same time he comes in a posture of humility, uh, humbling himself before uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Really, so far in this account, there's, there's very little for which you can fault the leper. We uh, might even be sympathetic to this leper, and it would be right for us to do so, even as we can relate to the cry that must have come out of the bottom of his soul when he asks the Lord Jesus Christ to heal him so that he would be part of uh, life and society again, to heal him from this certain slow, awful death sentence that he is under when it comes to this disease of leprosy. And as he pours out his soul to Christ in humility, Jesus' soul is not hard. His heart, his heart is tender towards this leper. It says in the text, it is moved with pity, moved with compassion. And it's good for us to hear our Lord Jesus Christ being moved with pity for a person who is in a place of need. One of the dangers in our relationally isolated social media age or living in a very wealthy society where the assumption is that someone else will take care of the problems that this one person faces, in this society we are rarely moved with pity, especially if it's someone that we don't know very well. Rarely do our hearts overflow with pity for a person who reaches out for help. But Christ is different. He is moved with pity, and more than that, he touches the man, which is a complete taboo when it comes to how you deal with leprous people in Israel. He touches the man, and he heals him. And the manner of healing again affirms for us the authority of Christ, because Christ speaks, and it says that the leper is healed immediately in verse 42. The leprosy leaves him, and he is made clean by the word of Jesus' command. His command over disease makes it plain that he is the Christ, and in some sense, the final result of that is that we can have certainty and assurance that his death on the cross is effective because he speaks the truth with authority. He does it in lesser ways, and because he does it in lesser ways, his authority in the greater as well. And so the leper received this tremendous benefit from Christ as he speaks authoritatively, and this leprosy leaves him. But those who benefit from Christ's works 
do not always give glory to him for them. And that's what we see in the lows of the, this healed leper. Now, to give glory to God is to recognize his greatness. We do it with our lips. We do it in our action. Uh, to give glory to God at some level is to recognize that greatness of God, that greatness uh, in, in all the persons of the Trinity, not only in theory, but also in understanding how we relate to that greatness. To give glory to God is not to pay a compliment to a peer. That's not to glorify somebody. That, that may be to encourage somebody. God is not in need of our encouragement. To give glory to God is to recognize that He is completely different than we are, that He is, is great and exalted and majestic and, and glorious and sinless and, and all these perfections that we can think of when we, uh, when we consider the Lord. Well, these are recognized in our relationship. It's one thing to say that God is great and greatly to be praised. It's another, another thing to live as if you actually believe that. And here we see the leper struggling with this uh, because one of the ways that we approach the greatness of god is to see clearly our own insignificance and because we recognize our own insignificance therefore to subordinate ourselves to god to place ourselves under him in humility to remain in some sense where the leper started when he came and approached jesus on on his knees to give glory to God is to relate to Him from a, uh, from a position of self-abasement, a lowering of yourself, not uh, self-exaltation, which is what we naturally want to do. And this leper engages in this kind of self-exaltation. Well, the leper had come knowing something about Jesus, being confident that Jesus could heal him, and, and believing that he would do so if he desired to do so. And, and even though this leper came in humility, here he fails to relate to the greatness of Christ as he should. It says in verse 43 that Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away. Jesus sternly charged him. Well, the Greek word that's translated sternly charged carries with it a sense of harshness, a sense of rebuke. Uh, it's, it's, it's not that Jesus was being harsh and rebuking this man, but it's not that Jesus was just making a suggestion to him. There was a, a gravity that was included in the words that Jesus shared with his man. And so, so Jesus gives his instruction which is far more, more than a mild suggestion, and he commands this healed man and expects him to obey. And the command that Jesus gives maybe catches us off guard again, maybe not as much because last Lord's Day we looked at this already, but in, in verse 44, what does Jesus say that this man should do? Jesus commands this man that he is to say nothing about what's happened, not to talk to nobody about this miraculous healing, and simply to go present himself to the priest that he could offer the sacrifice that Moses commanded in these very holiness code laws from Leviticus 13 that we were, were talking about. And so this command can surprise us because it seems so counterintuitive. But as we saw last Lord's Day, Jesus isn't really interested in simply having a gathering around him. Jesus is calling his saints out of the world. Jesus isn't looking to build a fan base. Jesus is looking to build his bride, the church, to call his people out of the world and to sanctify his saints. And so Jesus gives this leper this instruction. And though the leper starts with belief and humility, what we see as this brief paragraph comes to an end what we see is that this leper really is serving his own desires. Even though we might be puzzled at the nature of Jesus' instruction, the reality is that his instruction is, is quite simple. Uh, don't say anything and show yourself to the priests. Jesus has taken away the cause of this man's despair. He has freed him to be reintroduced into the life of society. 
He has, the removed, he has removed the threat of certain death and commands him as a result of those things, as a result of these gifts, that in gratitude this man would say nothing but go and show himself to uh, the priests. Well, the leper doesn't pay any attention, does he? In response, the leper leaves, and it says that he begins to talk freely about it in verse 45, and that he spreads the news. And when, even when you think about those two things that that leper does, it's easy for us to be sympathetic. Uh, in, some, in some sense, we even think that he could be doing a good thing. Because the word that is translated here to talk freely is the same word that, in, that is translated in other places uh, that a person preaches or proclaims, to proclaim the works of God. And when it says that this leper went and spread the news, that, another way of saying that is that he spreads the word, which when we come to the Great Commission, we might even think, well, that's exactly what people who are saved by Christ are supposed to do. They're supposed to preach they're supposed to proclaim, they're, they're supposed to spread the word of God. But in this case, it isn't a good thing because it is an explicit act of disobedience by the leper. To be joined to Christ by faith involves and includes the grace of repentance. And part of the grace of repentance is this new, this commitment to a new obedience to God in Christ. And so thankful obedience is a necessary fruit of, uh, that is part of the work of salvation. But the leper doesn't show gratitude at all. The leper is healed, and he is excited, and he is enthusiastic, but rather than being led by the word of God... He is led by his own feelings. He is led to do what he wants to do. In some sense, it's, a, it's the opposite of what happens to Paul in the book of Acts. In Acts 16, Paul's on his uh, second missionary journey. And, uh, he, and, and it says in verse 6 of chapter 16, they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. So uh, Paul doesn't go into a region, and he doesn't go into that region explicitly because God had forbidden him from going into that region by the Holy Spirit. So even though preaching and evangelizing is usually a good thing, in the case of Acts 16, it would not have been a good thing for Paul to go and preach in Asia because the Holy Spirit had forbidden him from doing so. If Paul would have gone to preach in Asia, he would have been in sin because it is sin to transgress the commandments of God. And the same thing is true here in this account as this leper comes face to face with the works of the Lord Jesus Christ and his own feelings and he chooses his own feelings over the commandments of God. And this account should cause some kind of a reaction in us. This man who had been given so much by the Lord Jesus Christ does not follow a simple command that the man who gave him his life back has just given to him. And when you read it, there should be something in, in you that says, <clears throat> that's not right. I almost said there should be something that, that's in you that says, I can't believe he did that. But if we're honest with ourselves, we can believe that he does that because we do the same kinds of things ourselves. But there's something in this account that makes us realize this is off. The, the man is, is not living as he should in response to the works of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not accidental that we re react to that story this way. Uh, because Jesus says one thing, but the le leper does something completely uh, different. In one sense, we can be sympathetic because we can appreciate the man's enthusiasm. But in another, there is this reaction where there's a recognition that at a base level, the leper is behaving ungratefully in this account. 
what the leper does here is to follow his own desires. It's a subtle way of disobeying because he's actually doing something that in other times would be considered good, but he's doing it contrary to the instruction that the Lord God Almighty has given to him. In some sense, the leper is like a child who does a good thing to get out of doing what he was told. And uh, we can all sympathize to this in the congregation. We, we love to fellowship afterwards, but it gets to be 10.30 after the evening service, and we say, okay, well, we probably should wrap it up and get home now. And so we say to our children, children, it's time to get in the car. We're going to go home. And uh, because we like socializing, five minutes later, you're about to make your way to the car to go on your way, and as you're walking out the building, you see your child in the fellowship hall wiping tables. Now, wiping tables in the fellowship hall is a good thing. It can be very beneficial to the body of Christ. It can be a way of service. All those things are good. But the child is doing something good instead of doing what he should, which is to get into the vehicle. And the same thing is true here of the leper. It seems like the leper is doing a good thing, even a natural thing, but really he is following his own desires over and against the command of the Lord. And our first response might be, well, his heart is in the right place, but that's not how the Lord views this kind of event. The Lord isn't only concerned with our hearts being in the right place. He is concerned with our obedience. In 1 Samuel 15, where we started this account of how Saul squandered his position as king uh, through his lawlessness, uh, he, is, he is waiting for Samuel to come and offer the sacrifice. And his soldiers are starting to flee. They're about to fight the Philistines, and his soldiers are fleeing because, because Samuel is so long in coming, and they're worried that the Philistines are going to attack them and that they are not going to be ready to fight because the sacrifice hasn't been offered yet. And so what does Saul do? Instead of doing what he should, Samuel, or Saul does something that is good, to offer a sacrifice to the Lord in, in other circumstances and through different men would be an, an act of worship. But Saul offers it on his own terms. Saul looks at the word of God and says, no, I will do it in my own way. And Saul rebukes him, or Sir Samuel rebukes Saul. And he says, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Now you put the leper up against what Samuel charged, rebuked Saul with, and it's the same thing. And 1 Samuel 15 shows us that what the leper did in that moment, I'm not my intention to make some kind of a final judgment about the condition of this man's soul. Uh, Christians sin, believers sin, and they sin badly at times. But this man in that moment when Jesus said, don't speak and go offer the gift to the priest, when he went out and spoke freely, he was an idolater. Because rather than serving the Lord, he was serving himself. So the story of the leper is in some sense is preparing us for how we should respond to this Jesus of Nazareth. As we've worked our way through the first chapter of this book, Jesus of Nazareth has been shown to be one who is attested by the prophets in verses 2 and 3. One who has been announced by John the Baptist in verses 4 through 8. Has been affirmed by the Father in chapter 1 and verse 9. Who has been visited with power from the Holy Spirit in chapter 1 and verse 10. Who is successful where the, last, uh, the first Adam failed in in, in standing against the temptations of the devil when he is visited in the wilderness. And you see that in verses 12 and 13. And because those things are true of Jesus, 
because Jesus is announced to be who he is in the opening verses of this book, our relationship with Christ is different than any other relationship. We don't relate to Jesus Christ as our peer. We don't relate to Jesus Christ as if he were just like, up, like us, except for he has a couple of upgrades. No, he is the God of heaven come in the flesh, as announced by the prophets, to bring redemption to his people. That changes everything. It changes, it should change how we approach him, how we live in relationship with him. And, and so many of the pitfalls that we as human beings step into are the result of a response to God that is not according to his instructions. We think that something is neat. We think that something is meaningful. And even though the Lord has not commanded us to do that, or maybe the Lord has forbidden us from doing that, we do it anyways because we want to express ourselves. Well, Jesus doesn't come for self-expression. That's not why he came. Jesus comes as the Lord of glory. Jesus would be right to come and simply demand and burn up in judgment anybody who doesn't meet his demands. He would be right to do that. There would be no sin in him doing that. And yet that's not what he does. As the Lord of glory, he, he comes and he gives gracious gifts to his people. And that's part of the relational response that we have towards him. That, that we respond to the things that he generously gives to us, even though we're not deserving of them. Like the leper who receives his life back, there should be a relational response, a response of gratitude from this healed man to the one who healed him, and yet is lacking. And before we think too little of the leper, we recognize ourselves in him. The text's response, curiously, doesn't really deal with the leper after the fact. It simply describes what the leper did and the impact that it had on Christ and his ministry. So we don't learn anything else of what happens to the leper. We don't, we don't have a record of, of Jesus finding him later and saying, what have you done, or, or anything like that. You see that sometimes in, in other accounts, in, in other Gospels. But the consequence of his action is recorded. As a result of this leper going and doing what Jesus said for him not to do, Jesus' fame continues to increase to such a point that he can't openly enter into towns and villages without being crushed by a crowd of people. And so instead, Jesus... He is in desolate places, and people are coming to him from all over the country. Well, what does that show us? Well, that shows us that the leper is not really able to thwart what Jesus came to do. It's not like Jesus or God's plan of redemption was knocked off track for a moment until, they, until the Trinity figured out how we're going to make this work. Now this man has ruined everything. It's not that, but it is showing the consequence of sinful action. It shows that his sinful action had an impact on the, the people who lived around him. His disobedience, in other words, has consequences. And from the leper then, from his painful example, we learn that we must keep our feelings from overriding our obedience. We are all tempted to serve God in our own way. That temptation is very strong in all people. And uh, there is uh, the, the word of God which, which pronounces the rich promise of, of salvation to an undeserving sinner. There is the kindness of God in the work of salvation, uh, which is great as he sends his son to be the sacrifice. And that's all plainly laid out for us in his word. And in the pages of God's Word, we see all that's necessary, all the things that we can know about God, they're contained in, in the pages of His Word, and, and all the refreshment that we can gain from the promises that He gives, that those who cling to Him by faith will be forgiven of their sins, 
uh, this, this notion that, that God not only rescues us into a position of neutrality, but that God uh, removes the dominion of sin over us here today already, this promise of this future inhabita- uh, habitation in glory, all these things that the Lord has set before us, we see all those things, and yet as God's people, we so often worship the true God in the wrong way. Even when we think we're doing something good, we may be running contrary to God's commands. Now, of course, as Reformed people who are serious about corporate worship and what we would call the regulative principle of worship, which says that in worship we only do what God commands, we can see some easy examples of how, how we as Christians get sideways with this notion where our feelings override the commandments of God. Now, the intent of these transgressions that we have against commandments of God usually stem from our enthusiasm. They're usually, especially when they're done within the church, they're usually a fairly sincere attempt at giving glory to God. And yet, what we do is we do what we want, we do that something that could be good, instead of doing what we should. So, in different places in worship, you can think of additions to corporate worship in dancing, or in playing movie clips, or uh, teaching through a, a secular film, some of the themes that are contained in Scripture. And these things can at times be helpful, but not in that moment. They're not helpful in that moment because we are doing in those moments the same thing that the leper did. Jesus said to the leper, in this moment, now that I have healed you, do this, don't uh, show yourself to the priest, don't do that, don't talk about this to anybody. In other moments, he commands the opposite. Uh, when he heals the, uh, the garrison demoniac, he, he tells him to go into the cities and to proclaim what has been done to him. But here, in this moment, it's different. This leper is ordered to, to do this, to go to the priest, and to not do that, to not talk to, to people. And so, taking that back to our our easy example of corporate worship, feelings of sincerity do not override God's calls to obedience. Simply being sincere in what we do in worship does not replace obeying God in worship. And the, the, the leper fails to see that, and at times we can fail to see that. Now let's move from the corporate to the personal because really when you think about corporate worship that's really the lower hanging fruit. It's it's true in our own lives as well. It comes out in in how we live in our families. How do we use our language? Do we give in to our feelings and and use our voices in a, a godless way? Do some of the words that come out of our mouths do they are they are they coming out of our mouths to cut to exercise vengeance against the people against who we're speaking? Are they filthy words? Are they blasphemous words? Uh, this is a way that your feelings can override your obedience. You can think about how you honor the Lord's Day. How often do you let your feelings be your guide when it comes to the Lord's Day? It'd be so much easier if if we just went and, and bought some, some lunch. I, I, I don't feel like going to church in the evening again. Why would I want to do that? I, I've been tired. I just want to sleep. I just want to rest. Rest and sleep is a good thing at some times. But not when God has called his people to worship. You see, our feelings so, e- so easily override our obedience. 
instead of doing what we should, we do something that in another time would be something good. So to live under the benefits of Christ's work is to live a thankful life, a life in relationship, a life that understands all the benefits that Christ has given to us through his ministry and sacrifice uh, in this world. And when we live that thankful life because of the sacrifice of Christ, the Lord sets parameters for us. To come face to face with Christ as Savior means that that Savior says to you, do this and don't do that. And however much we might feel that we would like to do this thing that he has told us not to do, or however much our feelings would like to not do the things that he has told us to do, a grateful life lives under the commands of God, not according to the feelings that come and go. So from the leper, there is this lesson of obedience over impulse. It's not a bare obedience. It's not an obedience void of a relationship. It is an obedience that is grounded in the very relationship that we have with God through Christ. Because we belong to God through Christ, therefore, we delight to do the things that God has commanded us. The Lord Jesus establishes his authority by his works. Also in the healing of this leper, when he speaks and the leprosy immediately leaves him. And yet there is this ungrateful response uh, from the leper to what he has done. Uh, the leper allows his feelings to overrule Christ's demands. And we have to remember that this man actually started in the right place. His words expressed faith. Uh, his, his, his kneeling was a sign of humility. But from that foundation, he did not build gratitude. And that is the call for the people of God. Because of Christ, because of what he has done, we live not doing something that is good in another moment, we live according to his commandments in this moment. And as we do that, we express our thanks to God of heaven. Let's pray together.